right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Piano Craft Gallery this evening. Uh, we are having our grand finale of the Chickering Salon series this evening. Um, director Frederica King, who is a world-renowned pianist, is going to be doing uh, performance this evening for us. She's been uh, a part of this show and she's been organizing all of the performances over the last three weeks that many of you have enjoyed. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Frederica King. Ultimately, he said, look, it's, you've just got to get it out there. 
you've got to get it out there. So there's a little concern now that he was trying to pass it off as his own, but that was not the case. There's a famous episode where he went to visit Queen Victoria, who was from the German part of the family, royal family, and she asked him to play something. He played a piece, and she complimented him, him on it, and he said, that's actually by my sister, kind of thing. So he did give his sister credit, kind of thing. But it's kind of hard to constantly be including that um, focus on women not having a public persona or a highly professional career. It often feels like I'm making it up, but then I have to mind myself it is true. So, short piece by Fanny Mendelssohn called Oh Dream of Youth, Oh Golden Star, and then one of Felix's pieces, something called Duetto.
about a woman who had a fabulous career. Okay. Uh, except I got to qualify that because she started off in her dad's household, right? So Clara Week was her maiden name. She became a prodigy virtuoso. She did her first public performance when she was about nine years old. Uh, she also started composing when she went on tour. She would give lessons, she would sell some of her compositions. She was heralded by the Grace Franz Liszt, by Chopin, by all kinds of other people. And then one of her father's students fell in love with her, a young man named Robert Schumann, who wanted to forsake the law because he was in love with literature, etc. And he and Clara bonded over music and poetry and just the fact that they were kindred spirits to the nth degree kind of thing. In the meantime, falling in love and considering what could happen in the future meant that her father became aware of this and sent Robert away, wouldn't teach him anymore. Part of the reason for that was that from the time Clara was five years old, her father had decided she was gonna be a virtuoso pianist and her great playing was gonna be a testament to his skill as a pedagogue and music teacher kind of thing. All of this kind of started with the parents who split up and one of the other children went with the mother and her step and the step parent and Clara stayed with her dad so that he kept her on this daily regimen of practice and writing in her journal, he even told her what to write sometimes. And then, you know, you gotta learn business and you have to write letters and you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to do the other kind of thing. So when Robert came along, it's like, oh no, I don't think so. Anyway, so they had to go to court ultimately after three years of upheaval in order to get permission to marry. They were one of the most famous romantic couples in music history. Sadly, he had some difficulties later in life, but he was a firm proponent of her being out there doing everything she could to maximize her talent and visibility. And she became also very much a muse for him because he had hurt his hand and he could not be a virtuoso pianist himself. He said, nobody can play my music like you can. Even if people can't understand it, nobody can communicate what I'm trying to say to people better than you can, kind of thing. There's huge collections of their letters to each other, which are just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But ultimately, it was a little less easy because he had mental difficulties. But I'm going to introduce you to one of her shorter pieces. She's written a wonderful trio for piano, violin, and cello. If you ever get a chance to hear any of her other music, please do. She's got a wonderful piano concerto. She's got the trio. She's got tons and tons of beautiful art songs, German in piano, for piano and voice. And this is a dance that was originally a Polish dance, but a lot of people started writing these short kinds of pieces for the amateur piano market, sheet music market.
friend. Um, his name is Innocent Okachupu, and he performed a program here with a beautiful, beautiful Nigerian soprano a couple of weeks ago. This is one of his shorter pieces, which is kind of in Western language, but essentially it is Nigerian. And it's a little bit tricky in some spots, and I hope I do it justice. It's called Indidi, which means patience. Uh, in his explanation, he mentions that, you know, as a young person, you often kind of want to do things quickly, and the older people always say, patience, patience, don't be in a hurry to get older. Don't be in a hurry to try to do things. You've got time, so on, so on, and so forth. Um, so it's a really nice piece. I think I kind of fell in love with it because it has like this lovely, almost lullaby kind of feeling to it.
Alrighty, I'm back. Uh, all right, so I'd like to introduce you to some works by African American composers. One gentleman, John W. Work III, and two ladies, Florence Price and Margaret Bonds. Uh, John W. Work III is famous for having worked at Fisk University, which was one of the first large colleges to open for formerly enslaved African descent students, so that this was an important breakthrough for people leading ultimately to things like the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and 30s, and the whole um, idea of the new Negro, intellectual, philosophical, creative, activist, etc., etc. Out of the Fisk, Jub out of Fisk University came the famous Fisk Jubilee Singers, who were formed in 1871. Their repertoire ultimately became African American spirituals, which they even brought here to Boston when they came to perform at Tremont Temple downtown. And they went all over the world. And part of what John Work wanted to do with some of his other things was kind of pull in the African American lifestyle in some of the areas out in the country, which in the forward motion might be getting left behind kind of thing. So this particular collection of pieces is called the Scuppernong Sweep. Scuppernong is a river down in South Carolina. There's also a very wonderful grape they have. I hear it makes really beautiful wine. And so it's just sort of vignettes from the life there. A number of other composers did that as well. Um, R. Nathaniel Dett and William Grant Still, and then later some other pieces, maybe even larger pieces like William Dawson's Symphony, which is celebrating the earlier part of the African-American experience to give people something to kind of look back to. So uh, at a certain church is starting off with um, this kind of clashing combination of pitches, which is like replicating a very metallic bell, trying calling people to the church, which is a wonderful outlet for the African-American community because it's a place of refuge. It's a place to also gain some inspiration, some fortitude for the coming week and whatever is the rest of the time is going to bring kind of thing. It also includes a hymn which is called I'm Bound for the Promised Land. So it speaks in the lyrics of the hymn about standing on the shores of Jordan, the stormy shores of Jordan, which is symbolic of crossing Jordan and then getting over to the promised land, the land of milk and honey that was promised to the children of Israel kind of thing. That's a really big part of African based people and other enslaved people converting to Christianity, the very attractive prospect that if they were believers and committed to a Christian life, they would have this ultimate reward where they would get many of the things that they had not gotten in real life. So that sustained a huge amount of the African American community. The second short piece, very short, is Ring Game, which was a sort of shuffling, moving, circular uh, dance that could be done as part of church things. And then the last part is something called Visitor from Town. There's not really any information about it, so I've kind of made up my own story, <laughs> which, is, which is that it's somebody kind of in a rural context. It seems kind of lazy, and it's got a kind of yearning quality to it, like this person's wanting to be someplace else but can't quite get to go someplace else. And then there's this very active part in the middle, which is almost like a train coming through and somebody talking about all well, the hustle and bustle of the city and what could be happening there. And then it's gone. And you go back to this yearning, which is almost worse than before, because now it's like, OK, I have a sense of there's something else out there that I might want to be involved in, but I still don't quite know how I'm going to get there kind of thing. So that's my story for visiting from town. Okay.
interesting looking music. Uh, because Florence Price is now very much kind of almost a poster woman for women African American composers. Uh, some of the stellar things of her career in 1932, she got a prize for her sonata in E minor, and that same year later she got a first prize for her symphony in E minor. Later, part of the symphony was premiered by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, very much a big feather in her cap. When I came to know about Florence Price, I was at a conference in Michigan, which was all black music, so many wonderful people. I met there, and one of them was this woman named Althea Waits, who had done a recording, which included some music of William Grant Still, George Walker, a bunch of other people, and Florence Price's Sonata. And I said, where can I get this music? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> and she said, I have it. And I said, well, can I take a copy of it? And she said, sure, there's my copy. <laughs> That's why it's so yellow, because it's really old. It is, the Sonata has since been published by G. Shermer. Um, I bought a copy and thinking, oh, well, this is gonna make life really easy. And I looked at it and it somehow seems very domesticated um, compared to my old copy, which just kind of seems like the real deal. Although, and that's a figment of my imagination. Um, so I continue to use this because I'm just kind of wedded to this particular copy. Um, it is the second movement of her sonata, which is based in traditional sonata form, meaning you have a very strong first movement in a traditional format of two melodies and a development section. Second movement is often a little more lyrical, and then the third movement is a little bit faster, more dramatic, more challenging, kind of end with a big bang kind of thing. This is not based on an actual spiritual or any hymn, but it does have the feeling of a hymn, and that's very much what stayed with African American composers, with some of the connection to the melodic framework and just the reference to the folk tradition, even if they weren't literal quotations.
Congress. There's a wonderful picture I discovered a few years ago. It's a photo of Clarence Price conducting a women's orchestra, and Margaret Bonds is the piano soloist. Oh, so anyway, so uh, Margaret Bonds ultimately became part of what was known as the Chicago Renaissance. There are numerous places where um, the African American population was moving forward, and so they kind of uh, gained strength by being together, started newspapers, writing things, and one of her great friends was Langston Hughes, and in her parents' home she also met any number of significant people, W.B. Du Bois, et cetera, kind of thing. She later did a number of things where Langston Hughes wrote the lyrics for like a choral piece, The Brown King, speaking of the Messiah as like a person of color, um, and then also any number of times when they corresponded with each other about the difficulty of, in her case, being an African-American female student at Northwestern University. Um, and, you know, she talks about being sometimes so disheartened and disconsolate that she would just wants to cry and give up. And he's basically like, no, you have the opportunity to make the most of it kind of thing. So it was a really important friendship to both of them. Um, this is based on the African-American spiritual wave in the water which is often included in discussions of coded spirituals, meaning there are lyrics in there that potentially have clues for someone who might be escaping, a uh, way to com com communicate information in a somewhat secretive fashion. Uh, so there is um, a melody, wade in the water, wade in the water, children, wade in the water, gods have been in trouble in the water, I should have practiced my singing. Anyway, um, so you hear that regularly throughout there. This is almost like a theme with a multiple iterations of the theme. And then it gets quite heated towards the end. It's got a tiny bit of a jazz inflection in the harmonic makeup of it. She was also really good with jazz things. And she and Mary Lou Williams are two of the women who brought, brought some jazz along with their classical stuff, along with the African American stuff. Very cool ladies. So mm -hmm. here's Troubled Water by Margaret Bonds. It's a handful.
art. All the artist interviews that have been done by Virginia, our curatorial and educational intern, who is then going to go to the floor. I could not have done the wonderful presentation I did on the history of the building and the making of pianos in America and the performances, everything, without the MVP of the Board of Directors, Eric Rao. Eric, please take a bow. <laughs> So I will happily do this again later on in the year and in the springtime and hopefully on into the future. May I be blessed with a long life full of music and good people. Au revoir. <laughs>